you, Jonathan. And uh, I want to introduce Josh Jackson. Josh, come on out. And then Patterson Hood. So Josh is the editor of Pace Magazine, former business partner of mine. And of course, you know Patterson probably, the lead singer and songwriter of Drive By Truckers and uh, also a Muscle Shoals native. And a lot of us learned a lot more about Muscle Shoals when the documentary aired and has, I think has some relation to what, what's happened here in Macon and what we hope to see happen again. So we'll have a, a wide ranging conversation about music, music criticism, and what music means to a community. So I want to start off uh, with a very general question, and that is, what are your views as a musician and as, a, as an editor of a music publication of the relationship between music and music criticism? How is it, what, what are sort of the supreme examples of how it can be helpful? What, is, what are sort of the worst examples you've seen of when it's not been helpful? And what's the general tenor of music criticism today, you think, in this relationship to music? I mean, I mean, I think it's, it, it's certainly an important thing, you know, because uh, I mean, there's less and less ways to be turned on to good music, and if if there's basically radio as we knew it growing up in my day or in our day or whenever, almost, almost non-existent now, and you know, there's more and more stuff out there, but you don't really know what is what, and so you know, if there's someone who's a uh, a good writer that you respect or whatever it can it can certainly help in knowing you know kind of weeding out and knowing what to look for and stuff I mean, as a you know as a teenager I, I first got turned on to REM by an older friend at the record store I worked at had read Chris Cow's review of Chronic Town and Chronic Town was like his tied for his record of the year in 82 and uh, so the friend bought Chronic Town, and then I heard it, and then I bought Chronic Town, and you know, and we were all REM fans, and so things like that. But um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's funny. We've definitely seen the the, the position of, of the music critic change since uh, since we started Pace Magazine in 2002. Um, you know. It was like Patterson says, you know, our, our role was was to help people discover new uh, new bands that they would love, and it still it still very much is. There's there's a lot more music criticism out there right now. There's it's been uh, um, you know so many different ways you can find music now. You can find it on a Pandora station because of some algorithm that told you that if you like X, that you'll like Y. Um, you can find it. Um, uh, on, on just a number of sites on the internet, um, but I, I still think music criticism is a great way because uh, not only just helping people discover music they love, but helping people um, experience music in a deeper way. I think that's what all arts criticism at its best can do. Um, our, when we uh, had the print magazine, we had a little um, uh, little uh, headline, and our, we called our our review section The Reckoning, and the little subhead was um, uh, Encounters with Art, and that was really our, our vision for what a, a review section should be. Um, you're going to uh, another person who has experienced this art, and he's going to tell you about his experience with the art, because that's really all they can do. It's, it's a little different than, than uh, reviewing a, a car stereo or a toaster. Um, it's very subjective. It's very personal. And uh, I think the best, the best music criticism comes from that place, comes from a very personal place of, of how you're experiencing the art, what it's meant to you. Um, because once the art's out there, I mean, you can, you can try to figure out the, the artists, what they're going for, um, what, you know, what this song might mean to them or, or anything like that. But really all you've got to go on is, is the art itself. And so, that's, that's the way that we approached it, was just that encounter with, with uh, a piece of music. I mean, I, I can resonate, you know, a lot of us got into music itself, you know, whether performing or just as a listener, because of 
you know, you hear something and then you get into it when you read, you know, back in the day, the Rolling Stone review or before that, the Cream review. Um, and, and, you know, the, the writers typically got into it because they were passionate about it. Um, but, and I also think of that scene in Almost Famous when uh, they first meet the young William and uh, the, the uh, Russell, I believe it was, the character, uh, says, oh, it's the enemy. You know, be careful, watch out. How, it, do you, can you relate to that? What, what sort of, when you see a, re, a reporter in the room, casually, do you, are you, are you on guard? Do you view that as someone who's really into music and a, a friend of sorts? I'm probably not on guard enough. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten in trouble from not being on guard enough, probably, but uh, I'm just by nature not real on guard. But, um, you know, we've, you know, you know, Overall, I, I, I can't complain too much about where we have fallen in all of the, you know, the grand scheme of things of, of rock criticism or whatever, because our bands, you know, we generally get pretty good reviews. And, and, uh, and I don't always agree with them, but they're generally at least seem to be intending to be favorable. And, uh, uh, but, um, you know, there's there's certainly been cases where we've allowed extra access to a writer or two along the way to write some big feature, and and we've batted about 500 on that. I, I think uh, a couple of those turned into really special pieces that you know I'll someday when I look back as an old man on you know the scrapbook will stand out, and a couple of them were just really bad. It's like, God, we let that guy be around us for two days and he wrote that, you know, <laughs> that's terrible. And, uh, you know, you're excommunicated. <laughs> but, uh, but so it's, I don't know, you know, it's, it, it's hard getting your stuff out there nowadays as a, as a, as a artist and musician, you know, it, it's, it's not easy and we're out there all the time. We tour, you know, more than most bands in any given year, and when you add up the number of years we've been doing it, you know, I'll put it up against most bands. I mean, we're, we're, we're somewhere really close to 2,000 shows now, and uh, the life of most bands never see anywhere near 1,000 shows. And uh, so we're, you know, we've, we've been doing it a long time, but uh, even with that, man, it, you know, it, you know, it, it's good when people are willing to write about our band or do anything to get people to notice it because, you know, the fans you have five years ago, they will, some of them will move on. And if you don't get new ones coming in, it, it, it's, you know, it's hard to support your family. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if everybody can relate to just how difficult it is to, you know, the, the barriers to entry in music have gone down. The, the tools now, anybody can make a record and, um, make it sound well if they know a little bit about right. make it sound good if they know what they're doing but getting attention is harder than ever i mean it's so fragmented the 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 voices that would drive hits now or from the radio to print to all across the board have have vanished or shrunken in prominence for sure um, so how you know what what is it like being out there how do you get your albums out what are the things that move records and and on the flip side you know being part of that um, when, you know, when, when we were publishing a print magazine, we were the third largest after Rolling Stone and Spin, uh, but it, you know, and still getting a lot of visitors on the website now, but the competition is, is enormous, and you feel like you've got, I'm asking a two-part question of each of you, but um, how, you know, how do you adjust to that, and do you feel like there, your influence is different now in print and online than it was in print? So I guess we'll start with Patterson, and. How do you get attention? How do you get your records out there and let people know, particularly new fans? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm still, I'm still figuring it out each time. You know, each record, you know, it was three years between this last one and the one before it, and the business had changed a good bit in that time. And, uh, you know, we, we um, so I don't even know. I mean, we, we just do it. We just go out there and just kind of hit it with, you know, we're lucky we have, you know, we, we have, had a, have had a good publicist who is able to get enough of that going and people 
for some reason still are willing to write about us and I appreciate that and uh, you know and it, it helps that the new record seems like it was kind of better received than the last several have been so so that adds to the story you know there's a you know the comeback story is always a good angle <laughs> if you can pull it off so uh, but I you know I other than that it's just going out there and just hitting it and uh, you know I spend you know, weeks before we leave for the start of the tour, on as my wife can attest, on the phone doing press, you know, talk, doing interviews and talking to people, you know, all over the world about the record, which is, you know, one of the harder parts of my job, for sure. And uh, uh, it's harder than the actual touring in a lot of ways because you're having to talk about it, you know, and it's easier to do it than to talk about it a lot of times. But, um, and, you know, and then the first month we were touring, or hell, first two months we were touring, you know, I would spend every afternoon doing a couple of hours of press or going to radio stations or going to, you know, where some website is hosted or, or doing some record store or some kind of live appearance in the afternoon, then have to get back in time for sound check, find time to eat, and then it's showtime. And it's when you're doing that for weeks at a time on a tour when you're playing six nights a week, it, you know, it takes a toll. It gets really hard. So it ain't getting any easier out there for sure. Yeah, on the uh on the, the media side, we, um, PaceMagazine.com now gets three million visitors every month. So it's a much bigger audience than we're reaching, uh, than what we were reaching in print. But each of those people might find a few stories at Pace that they're reading. So, so we're not going as deep with each person, um, but we're hitting a broader audience. So uh, when you're talking about music criticism and, and music reviews, um, it is very diffuse. It's it's not that uh, you know it's the rare review that gets people talking. It's a rare review that gets people's attention, like maybe a Robert Christgau, um writing about REM in, in 1981, and that having an effect on kids across the country because they visited a record store who was reading that that you know the Village Voice or Rolling Stone or whatever it was that that was sort of spreading it around. So. Um, it, it's definitely changed. Um, there is a, a ton of um, uh, competition out there. There's, uh, you know, I, I imagine that that uh, um, when uh, when you guys released uh, English Oceans, it was that you got probably got more reviews than you've ever had before. But you, pr you probably haven't even read them all. They're probably on, you know, every college paper and every um, blog and, and and all these different places. So you've got lots of little, you know, lots of people writing for smaller audiences about that record than, you know, it mattering what Rolling Stone says about your record um, right. and getting that that one review that, that people are around. So it is, it is a much less centralized conversation that's happening about music right now. I think when I look at music industry in general, I think that that may have been the best development for actual music fans over the years because it's now not up to six dudes who own radio stations and three editors at major magazines that decide what it is that you're going to hear. Um, who's going to decide that is a million little people uh, all across the country that are are not, you know, that, that radio person might have been looking for the next Nirvana and then is going to give you six imitations of Nirvana, whereas all these people that are just writing about music that they love are going to get excited about something that's completely new and crazy and different. And uh, they're going to tell their friends and it's going to sort of bubble up to the surface. And that's why, you know, f for a while now, I mean, some of the bands that are getting people most excited are doing something new um, and doing something different and getting attention by the content of what it is they're doing. So I, I think in general it's a good thing. It doesn't make it easier, I think, for either of us to, uh, to do what we do, but right. um, that's the, uh, or, and, and it certainly doesn't make it easier to make a living as a musician because um, 
there's just a lot more people doing it. And uh, you know, Tim, that when we started started Paste back in 1998 with the uh, selling CDs, the, the general idea behind that was how do we help musicians make a middle class living? Because um, we had a lot of friends who were musicians and we just wanted more people to know about what they did. And, and uh, uh, to some extent, you see more of that because there's not the superstars. It's, it's a lot more sort of in the middle, but it doesn't mean it's, it's an easy middle class living to make. Right. I mean, I have to, you know, I have to say as much as I, because I don't want it ever to sound like I was belly aching because in, in some ways we used to joke when our band first started kind of getting some traction and getting attention, it kind of coincided with the, the first big burst of what's regarded as the death of the music industry. I mean, our, you know, we, we kind of came along just as the old way of doing it was kind of starting to collapse and that was sort of our end. You know, we were a band that wasn't going to get a record deal. We were, we were too, whatever we were too much of. We were too much or too little of too many things to, to fit the, the profile of what was going to get a record deal in 1998 or 99 or whatever. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, Southern Rock Opera came out. The big news around the time Southern Rock Opera came out as far as in the music was Napster was you know bringing about the death of the record industry as we know it and right around that time we put that record out which we you know self-released originally and you know raised the money in a very comparable way to what's now known as I guess you know Kickstarter and all that stuff but before all those existed we sort of you know used that model or, or kind of you know stumbled on that model and um, and it was very beneficial for us you know because uh, it was knocking we weren't having to compete with the big labels as much as we would have because they were having such troubles we were able to kind of find our little niche and ride it and uh, so uh, so it's kind of you know two-way thing it's it's been helpful at times but then at other times it's like well it'd be awful nice if you know there were still record stores, you know, <laughs> and, and people still buying more actual records, but, you know. We had the, uh, the um, great uh, situation where we were not only part of the dying music industry, but also part of the dying magazine industry. Right, so. <laughs> right. But I think it helped us, too, because we, we did things differently. Yeah. People, if you can adapt, it helps, yeah. you know, and that's certainly what our band has tried to do. Well, as a, as a music listener yourself, how do you get turned on to music? What are your sources? And um, I mean, yeah, I, I buy as many records now as I did when I was a teenager. I mean, I buy a lot of records, and, uh, and I am an avid music lover, but it's, I just kind of keep my ears open and try to, you know, it's a combination of, you know, sometimes I'll read about something in a review or sometimes you know, someone will tell me about it or it'll be someone I stumbled upon live or at a festival or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm always kind of, you know, I'm always still looking for the band that'll make me fall in love. And uh, I'm as passionate about my music listening and buying as I was when I was a kid. And I'm, I'm very happy about that. So, uh, but it's a combination of, you know, it's it's not from Rolling Stone, I'll tell you that. I, I don't I can't remember the last time, you know, I got turned on to something new there. <laughs> it's it's definitely more the 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 you know publications like y'all's and, and and you know just kind of I don't know, out there. You know, out on the road. What about you, Josh? I mean you obviously get sent a ton of music. We get sent a ton of music, but really, if you want to know the secret, it's to surround myself with young interns and uh, young staff who all go out to shows religiously um, right. while I'm home with my kids at night. And, uh, um, you know, people, you know, I, I work in an office where nothing gets everybody as excited as a new band that they love the music for. And, you know, we'll play it in the office and... Uh, you know, when somebody gets really excited about something and we're listening to a ton of new stuff, or even some one of our writers gets excited about something and, and writes a great review, and 
and we play it in the office and 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 uh, yeah, that's that's how we'll do. And then going to places like South by Southwest and and listening. I mean, listening to a lot of music is really the the key. I mean, we we listen to a ton and we find bands to come play our shows. But yeah, I mean, you hear that band and you're like, oh, this is great. This is new. This is something. What they're doing here, I haven't heard this. This is. I mean, that's that's a great feeling, as you say, the the band to make you fall in love, the band sure. to to get that same feeling that when you were a teenager and uh, you know found this new band and, and went down this rabbit trail to other bands. I mean, like, there's no reason to stop doing that. that those feelings don't dim with age or, or go away, so. And I, I mean, I, and I do think there is as much great new music being made now as at any point in time, you know. It may not be the, uh, the it may not be capturing the, the zeitgeist or whatever, you know, like it used to be in the, you know, it's not, you know, you know, used to when the Beatles put out a new record, it was the biggest thing in the world and everybody bought that record immediately and listened to it and knew every word. And it's so splintered now. Now there's not any one band or, or 10 bands or even 100 bands. Now it's just so scattered. But if you take the time to go out and seek it out, there's still great music being made. I mean, there's bands that are just phenomenally good mm -hmm. out there playing in, you know, rooms a lot smaller than this and, uh, you know, night after night. And so it's still there. It just takes more work to go find it. And you both talked about live music. I think one of the ironies, I guess, of the digital age is that that has become much more an important part of what a band does. And that's how a lot of people discover new music. And that's about the only way to make money. You're certainly not making it on album sales. I no. mean, it's, it's <laughs> not only what you're getting paid to do a gig, but the t-shirt sales and, and all of that. Can you talk a little bit about how that has changed as you've... Yeah, and we're about? lucky because we're, we're, you know, we're kind of known as a, a good live band and, we, and, and we're, you know, physically healthy and able to get out there and do this night after night and so we're able to carve out a, a decent living out of it and we're really lucky with that and like you said t-shirt sales thank god for those you know <laughs> as, uh, as Cooley put it you know they hadn't figured out how to download those yet you know so they <laughs> and so it's it's 3d you know, printers just give it time yeah well, i know it's a matter of time but um uh, everybody's making their own Cooley Bird shirts, but um, um, but don't do it. Um, we got kids, but um, but it's you know it's uh, so we're we're lucky. But you know I do, you know it does make me wonder you know what it's going to be like ten years from now when you know I'm a good bit older and my kids are teenagers, you know, and I'm like God, how am I going to, you know, you know the idea of being in my 60s, touring 150 days a year is not a pretty picture. And, uh, you know, I, I hope to be playing shows as long as I'm alive, but I don't necessarily want to spend six months of every year on the road for the rest of my life. So I don't know. I don't know where, the, I don't know where that points us no. or what the answer is or if there is one. I don't know if there is one. Do either of you see... Is there hope <laughs> that at least there's a solution that will evolve? I know in, in the print industry, there's sort of this general feeling that at some point somebody will figure out how to monetize it. And then <laughs> the, we'll, you know, eventually we'll get there. Is, is there that feeling in music that at some point Spotify and those digital services will pay something that's re real? Or is it, is it more despair that you're going to be working for pennies forever and, and grueling it out and grinding it out on the road? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I try to be optimistic, but I, you know, whoever figures out the answer will probably figure out the answer for some corporation to make more money off of us, you know, instead of us making more money off of us. But so I don't know. It's uh, um, I'm as curious as anybody where it's going to all end up. Yeah, I don't. I don't have the answer to that. I mean, with, with the streaming services, they pay so little right now because they're making so little. Um, you know, we can beat up on, on Spotify and RDO and the rest, but, um, you know, those are companies that are, are only exist because people keep pouring money into them. Um, when you're dealing with free streaming services and relying on ads to support it, that's a tough model to, 
to make money on. Um, so I, it may, you know, it's going to evolve and change a lot, and that may be with companies going out and and laws changing that that determine what you know what minimums on on streams or, or something like that, where where you know that's been sort of the model for for publishing percentages over the years. I mean that. that those laws have, have had to change and evolve with new technology, and, and I don't think it's really caught up right now. So um, enjoy your streaming music while you have it. I don't know if that's going to, um, uh, without people subscribing to those services uh, and paying their $10 a month that gets split among the artists, um, making money from recorded music is a tough thing. So we'll open it up to a questions in a minute, but I want to talk briefly about music and local communities. I mean, you've grown up, your dad uh, was one of the instrumental guys in, in Muscle Shoals, and while that wasn't, it's a very different type of music community and it probably waned by the time you were growing up there, and, and you've been in Athens for 20 years and uh, still a thriving music community. Right. Uh, sure. What and you've traveled and seen a lot of a lot of communities. Uh, and, and you've been to a lot of festivals and written about music communities. So I'm interested from both of you. What do you think makes a music community thrive and become in Athens or a much smaller, you know, Denton, Texas? Or, uh, and what what causes a decline of music communities? And, and I know that's a, a dark science or art, right. but uh, what's sort of your perspective on that? You know. I mean, having musicians is a good start. You know, Denton, Texas, you know, there's an a incredible music school at that college that's in Denton. So I think that was the beginning of that scene is there were just so many musicians there at that school and they started bands and then, you know, some of the bands thrived and, you know, and, and one thing led to another. And that is probably one of the best music scenes per capita anywhere. I mean, it's a, you know, even though it's not as well known as Athens or Portland or Seattle or something like that, it's a, it's a really impressive scene and there, there's so much talent in it, even if there hasn't been as much buzz or, uh, you know, exploding bands from it. But, um, you know, I moved to Athens because it was a music scene. I mean, that was, that was the, you know, absolute reason I was there. And, uh, because I didn't go to college there, and uh, I was, uh, you know, I wanted I wanted to find a town where there were a lot of creative, and talented people doing art and music, and uh, I didn't want to go to Nashville because at that time, in, which was in the early '90s, Nashville was still very. So much of the music scene there was based around trying to get a record deal, trying to get you know some kind of it was all about the business end of it and I wanted to be somewhere where the emphasis was on the creative end of it which in all fairness is does exist in Nashville now Nashville's got a, a really amazing music scene now on, on all these different levels but in 94 it was pretty much the business part of it and then you know a few underground punk bands that weren't getting anywhere at the time so uh so Athens was kind of the, the, you know, the perfect fit for me, and uh, and as it turned out, it it all turned out well for me with that because I was able to find the people that I needed to put together this band in my head, and uh, um, I had when I'd come home from tour, there were places to play, there were there were good venues, so I could, you know, supplement, I could help pay off the debt I ran up touring by coming home and playing the 40 watt or whatever, you know, and and, uh, uh, and and there were even receptive day jobs that would allow you to take off tour and you could still come back and still have your job. That in itself was a, was a kind of a foreign concept for anywhere else I'd ever lived, you know. Before you'd have to quit your job to go on tour, then when you come back you have to find another job. And in Athens, it's kind of like so many people did that that it was just part of how it was done. You know, if you, you know, all the jobs I worked in Athens, uh, I was able to 
leave for three months and tour and come back and you know wash the same dishes I washed before I left and so and that's that's a big thing that's a big help just getting that kind of support you know and uh, cheap rent helps which Athens doesn't have as much now I mean it's still a lot cheaper than you know living in Austin or you know a lot of the cities but but it's it's you know I couldn't have moved to Athens paying what rent costs now, you know, making what I made in 94. I couldn't, I couldn't pull that off now. I, I probably wouldn't have been able to move there if it was like it is now, so. Um, I think the, the number one thing I've noticed when you see a great music scene, or almost the, almost the definition of a good music scene, is a city where musicians go to hear each other play. Yeah, they play live. great I mean, answer. That's the, the simplest thing. If, if you've got a group of, of musicians who are friends, who are interconnected, who are playing in each other's bands, who are playing on each other's albums, I mean, that's, that's the start of it. And if there's something happening, and in the, in, I mean, again, I mean, it kind of goes back to the music. If the music's bad, then that's going to be harder because people are going to go to be polite rather than go to hear something special. But if there's something special happening musically, then that's going to push the other bands creatively. Um, that's going to affect, you know, they're going to be influenced by the sounds that are coming out. If those are new, original, I mean, in music, it's all taking what's been done before and putting it together in a different package. But if it is a different, a different way of put, you know, different formula, a different, you know, mixture of things that are going and and uh, something different happening there that, that's going to get the local community excited because of what I was talking about earlier that stuff does seem to bubble up from the surface that that'll start getting noticed so I mean it's you know it, it I guess there's two pieces to that one which you know you can make the decision to do as as part of a community is, is get on board with going to see everybody other shows and the other part is just you know you gotta have that special thing for it to matter that there's a a music community there, something that'll get people excited about hearing it if if they get exposed to it from around. The exposure part, I think, is follows all that. I mean, if, if those two things are happening, I think the exposure follows. When I first moved to Athens, uh, I had never lived in a town that had a thriving live music scene because the, the thing that happened in Muscle Shoals wasn't about live music. It was a recording thing. It was uh, It was, you know, young guys who started a studio and they made a couple of records with other young local people that a couple of them took off. You know, one of those records happened to be When a Man Loves a Woman and one of those records happened to be I'm Your Puppet and they had, a, you know, and uh, You Better Move On by Arthur Alexander and all of a sudden, you know, big time record producer like Jerry Wexler starts bringing other artists in to record with those musicians who had that sound that made that record and next thing you know the Rolling Stones are recording there and all these different people are recording in this dry county redneck bobble belt town and it was it's an amazing story it's on a movie now you know and uh, it's a really amazing story but it wasn't about going out and seeing live bands. There were no live bands. It was a dry county. You know, you could, when I was growing up, you could go up to the state line and see, you know, some pretty good musicians covering whatever was in the top 40 or whatever the country hits of the day were. But there were, there were no REMs or pylons or glands or, you know, people making original music in their, you know, in their garages and going out and playing in clubs there because it didn't exist. And, um, so I was so thrilled when I moved to Athens that all of a sudden, you know, there was the 40 watt down the street and there was the hi-hat back then and uh, Atomic and all these different, you know, clubs with music playing all the time. And I literally went out five nights, at least five nights a week, some, some weeks, six nights a week to see, you know, I would just, I'd go see every, I wanted to see every band in town. I wanted, I wanted to kind of immerse myself in this scene in this town I'd moved to. And, um, and it was great. I mean, it was just, you know, it was one of the best times of my life. And, uh, and uh, I was like, well, maybe I should get a job working in one of these clubs so I'm not having to get up and work at a restaurant all day. So then I got a job working sound, and et cetera, et cetera. But. All right. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. 
Jonathan has a mic. <coughs> you raise your hand, he'll bring it to you. Anyone? You guys touched a little bit on like a little bit of the dichotomy between the old, you know, quotation old scene or old like radio stations, you know, defining like a zeitgeist of culture and things like that. And then this new way of doing things with free streaming or very low cost streaming and very low cost entry. I mean, every MacBook comes with GarageBand and you, you know, that sort of thing. Um, do you see, I'm curious, do you see the old way declining even further with radio and pop stars and that sort of giant machine that still, you know, you have your clear channels and your cumulus and those things kind of still defining or trying their hardest to beat us over the head to define culture, sort of. Um, do you see that declining even more and more mass acceptance and more splintering and more genres? I mean, the genre list on Spotify now is, you know, <laughs> pages long because you can't just do rock, hip hop, you know, and so on. So. That sort of stuff fascinates me a lot, and I just wondered if you might, I know you were, it's like anyone's guess, and it's sort of speculation at best, but that really fascinates me, and I just wondered from you. Uh, it fascinates me too, yeah. Um, I, I think um, to some extent you'll, you'll see that among, among music fans. I think what you still have now, and that probably won't go away, is massive companies catering to casual music fans. So if people don't, want to dive in and read blogs or read even sites like ours, you know, you can turn on a country radio station and somebody's pre-selected music for you and those artists that they pre-selected are going to be very big because there's, they got to have scalability to do that. They got to have, you know, your, your standards across multiple cities and everything sounds the same, you know, sounds like across whatever you turn on a country radio station in Georgia, it's going to sound like what you, when you turn one on in Alaska. It's it's that's the format. So, so I don't think that there's going to be huge amounts of splintering on that level. Um, you know, there, we'll always have pop stars um, because there will always be you know 14 year old girls and boys who just want to hear whatever gets you know or the the alt radio you know the the alternative rock station because. You you either don't have the time or the care or you haven't developed that sense yet or, or whatever you know I mean and that's not to degrade what's happening on pop country radio. There's still some great songwriters and great you know it's still going to be they're going to try to find really good stuff for that market. So I don't think that's going to get this splintered. Um, I think that exists the way it does for for a very good reason. But uh, you know among people who love music as, as an art form and, and want to hear it in many different forms and many different things, then it's just, I think there's gonna be more opportunities for more people to have their music heard. So there is, there's, the splintering happens in that regard. Yeah, I mean, we we saw that decrease uh, rapidly, and and you know, big companies saw that decrease rapidly when uh, when Apple came out with the iPod. Like, it became so much more important to people to be able to fill that little box with music that they liked. And uh, you know, I mean, what what we experienced at at Paste was, um, and we came up right around that time, um, was everybody. When I would talk to people, everybody thought they had very eclectic taste in music, and everybody who liked music because they liked all these different things, and they, because the way that marketing had been done before, it assumed that you were a fan of this kind of music or this kind of music or this kind of music, and when you had that little box in your hand, that sort of frees you up to put it on shuffle, and it wasn't, it's cool, you know, you go from, you know, from from David Bowie to Johnny Cash and to REM to to whatever, and and. You know, it wasn't these segmented things. It was just great music. So, um, yeah, as it gets easier, I think we've seen that in drastic ways. I think that's why we have. That's that's why, you know, truckers can have a, a music career is because people 
can access, you know, can can find them and and go, oh, this is great. Whereas those big corporate entities weren't probably gonna gonna cater to to some, you know, it, it didn't fit in a neat box. So yeah, I, I think there is some decrease in that. But I think I think we've gotten to a point now where it's pretty easy if you want to be a music fan to be a music fan. So. Fortunately, there are lots of those still out there. I mean, a lot of people love music. <laughs> it's yeah. just, they don't have to pay for it anymore. Uh, I've got a quick question for you guys. You were talking about different art forms that have um, uh, passed in the, in the music industry, and I think one of those is the, um, the design of the, the album art itself. And it used to be the album art was very descriptive. I mean, you know, Dark Side of the Moons is um, iconic uh, al album art as uh, the album itself. Everyone is easily recognizable. And Patterson, you guys have uh, very recognizable art on all of your albums, and I was just going to uh, see how that as a marketing strategy worked for you guys, or um, if anyone's tried to change that for, or, or have you go in a different direction, or, or just a little bit more about the album art itself. Uh, it, it amazed me how much resistance we did get about that at one point in time about it. I mean, there was, you know, there was a, uh, you know, grumblings from record label we were on for a while about, you know, we all, you know, you always do those same, have that same guy do your album covers, you know, do this different kind of thing and all that. But, but that has worked really well for us. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's as much associated with our, you know, Wes's art is as much associated with our music as, as you know, on the level that we are, as the Pink Floyd thing is on the hypnosis covers were for them. And I grew up loving that stuff. I mean, I grew up loving those old hypnosis covers and, uh, and um, you know, and Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, that was a great cover. It's a great album cover, you know. It was, it was in my formative years, such a big deal. And so I, I always wanted that to be part of what we did, to have this kind of visual element that you associate with it, you know. And, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's been great for us, you know. Because like I alluded to earlier, you know, we, we, we probably make more of our living from t selling T-shirts than selling records. And the fact that there's this visual element to our music and our that our that the fans associate with it and therefore are willing to wear or you know hang on their wall or whatever it's uh you know it's it's been very good and i highly recommend it to young artists starting out to have some kind of a recognizable visual element that you can have that you can take with you even if it's something that changes from record to record if something that still you know you know you have that. It's, it's, it's a good thing. And I think one of the things I miss most about the old school days are liner notes. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to, my favorite musicians, I could tell you who the session musicians are who played on their albums, and for the most part, unless I've gone out to buy the vinyl, right. no idea. Yeah, talk about, um, you know, we're talking about music criticism here. We are so much more expected to be able to write about these albums without maybe even knowing what the lyrics are, <laughs> without knowing who's played on it. I mean, we get these records and we'll ask for, oh, you didn't send any liner notes, right? And We do. And you guys we do, yeah, that. and we, we greatly appreciate that. That's um, very helpful for us to do our job. about jobs. that from day one, that that goes out with it. The, the, you know, if possible, even the artwork, if it's not still being worked on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so, uh, you know, and then, then you just hope they look at it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Other questions? Hello. I'm a visual artist, so I'm very interested in the graphic design and so forth and things you were talking about with album cover stuff, although I, was, I love music as well. But what you were talking about earlier about um, how the music industry and the magazine industry are changing and so forth. I see the same thing happening in the visual arts. I've seen for some time it's becoming easier because of digitization. I'm a digital artist myself. I work with computer art. So I see a lot of the same kind of things happening. And the problem, from a business point of view, as an artist trying to sell my art, just like you're trying to sell your music, it's a matter of trying to understand uh, about 
promotion and, and business, you know, things to promote your art and finding skills, finding skilled people. And I'm trying to learn the skills myself to do some of this stuff too. So I think that's a, something that maybe you should focus on, is trying to find people to help, help with the production, I mean the promotion mm -hmm. of that, of your art, is the, to help promote that so you can help make a living and so forth. Yeah, there's a, um, you know, as you're, as you're in a band or, or as a visual artist, there's uh, some ways now you're expected to do everything. You're expected to be an entrepreneur and a business person and, you know, eventually you get to the point where you can have a manager and a publicity, a publicist and um, somebody to try to get your music onto to radio station, you know, like there's these little pieces and you build a team around yourself. And I know you, I mean, that's, I'm sure that's been helpful for you guys, but there was that time before that happened that you not only had to create great art, you had to, you had to market it and, and you know, you had to, you had to manage it and, and do all those, uh, you know, it was like, I'm sure there's some ways of being in a band is like going to business school. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, it's, I mean, there was a time when I booked every show and I, I, I managed the band and I, you know, I mean, I, you name it, I've had, I've worked, other than being the drummer, I think I've worked every job in our organization at one point in time because I was a sound guy too and uh, I've been a light guy. I've done pretty much every, every end of the business, I think, I've worked. I worked retail, worked at a record store, so I've done... You name it, you know, and uh, I don't miss most of those jobs <laughs> very much. I'm, I'm thankful for people who do a lot of those things now, so it doesn't all fall on me anymore, that's for sure. Are you still heavily involved? I mean, do you sit down and talk about the marketing strategy behind an album, or do you just kind of leave that to the professionals? Uh, eh, somewhere in the middle. I mean, I, I like to be in the loop. I definitely want to be in the loop, but I don't have to be hands on everything. I mean, the people we have working for us, a lot of them have been with us for a long time. And, uh, and, and so it's gotten to a point now where, you know, if I miss a meeting or a phone call, I'm not gonna end up being portrayed in some way that makes me cringe the next day. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, they, Kevin and Christine have been with us, our managers have been with us for the better part of a decade. So, you know, they know that I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of a, a great, awful example of something that would be terrible if the next day I saw, you know, us doing. <laughs> but uh, they know better, so uh, there's not too much of that. We've, you know, we've kind of had the same people on our team, you know, one at a time. It took us a lot of bad managers before we found the management we have now. But it, it, uh, it, it it's. I don't have to be as hands-on as I used to, and I love that. So I, I would way prefer to get to do more and more creative and less and less of the bullshit, you know, but, but, um, but I still like to be in the loop. Yeah, but if, if you don't have that team, um, then there's a, a big advantage to learning to do those different roles yourself. And that's what, you know, a lot of, a lot of artists who've, who've made it to the level where they have a team, they got there because they were either particularly skilled or just made sure that they learned you know that role of, of promotion and, and marketing themselves and, and selling themselves to get noticed and and get get to a level where you can you can start building um, uh, some key people around you to to help do those things that that you might not want to do do in the long term it's extremely important I mean uh, you know, I go in um, about once a year, David Barbie, who uh, runs the Music Business School now at UGA, uh, the MBUS program, he uh, has me come over and speak to the class. And that's the, the thing I really reiterate every time is like, you know, whatever end of this business you're in, do as much of it yourself for as long as you can before you sign it off to someone else because then you number one because then you know how to do it and and you know how it needs to be done for what you're trying to do and then you know if the person that takes it over 
if they're screwing up or not because you've done it yourself and you can tell when they're screwing up. Otherwise, you might not know. And 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 just the the further you can do, the further you can get on your own, the better off you are. I mean, I, I you know, for a number of years we booked ourselves even though we could have probably gotten someone to book us, but it would have been some guy who would have booked us into the same rooms I was booking us into. And it's like, I didn't, it's like, I don't want a booking agent until I can get one that can put me in the rooms I can't get into. And in order to get to that point, we had to get a certain f distance far along ourselves, you know, and actually, I mean, we actually held out for the, the specific guy we wanted for a couple of years. We kind of held out and couldn't even get him to come see us because of that. And we didn't have a second choice, really. And uh, eventually he came to see us, and he's been booking our band for 13 years now. So, you know, but, and does a great job. So. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, my question is, how do you decide um, who to review? I know you said you go to shows and festivals um, and you listen to music in the office, but um, how do you cut through the noise and how do, you, how do you give bad reviews and decide who gets bad reviews and good reviews? Um, well, who gets bad reviews? I mean, we generally um, try to assign stuff that we're either excited about because, you know, it's a new artist coming up and, and there's something there that we... Um, saw in that, that record and then signed to somebody, or it's an artist that's, that's very well established that our audience is going to care about and, and uh, want to know our opinion on already. So, so we don't, you know, hear a new album by somebody we've never heard of and go, oh, this is terrible, this will be really fun to pan. I mean, it's just, there's no point in doing that. And, uh, I mean, negative reviews in, in, in general are, are kind of a, a different animal. And when, I've noticed, um, you know, and, and, and we still have them, and we'll assign stuff because we liked it or we saw something, but somebody, you know, we didn't spend the time that the, the, art, the writer spent with it, and they, they dug into it and found it wanting, um, and they'll write a negative review of it. Um, I've noticed that young writers writing negative reviews can be really cruel because they have not connected the dots to the person on the other end, and they've you know, there, there's a brashness of youth that, that kind of, you know, when you've done that, when you've panned that, that record and then you encounter those people and, and you start to, you know, I mean, as you just grow and mature as a person, um, negative reviews become a little less fun to write, um, uh, still important to write at times, um, but um, yeah, th there's, you can you can do it in such a way of being a, a decent human and writing you know writing what needs to be written so um so yeah negative reviews are, are, are a different thing because it's typically when we write something that's that would come across almost vicious it's when you know an artist with such promise just you know f just seems to be phoning it in and you know i mean that it, it happens at times it, 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 I don't know if the artist is getting caught up in what they're doing and just feels like they need to put out another album because it's time to put out another album or whatever, but you just, you have those records and, and you know, we want as a service to our readers to let people know that's not, that's not worth your time. But for the most part, what we review is what we're excited about. What we, you know, we always say that, that the people on staff um, and, the, and the people that are writing for us are generally the people that that made, uh, depending on their generation, the, the mixtape, that's my generation, the mix CD or, you know, the, I guess, Spotify playlist at this point um, for their friends. You know, like the, the one who wanted to share music for the joy of sharing music and wanted, you know, you gotta hear this because there is some, that, that sharing of, of that, that piece of art that you love, whether it's a book or a movie or, you know, I mean, there's, there's a joy that we get out of that. And so that's where most of our assigning decisions comes from, is, is this is something that people should know about. Um, it's a completely subjective um, uh, judgment. It's a completely personal judgment. Um, well, I made peace with that a long time ago, that, that uh, I was gonna write, you know, or create a magazine or, or write stories for, for people who 
saw the world the way I did, and, and maybe there's lots of them out there, or saw, you know, saw something that had the same taste, or, or whatever. It's just, this is my opinion, this is what I'm gonna put out there, and that's what we do there. So, if we're excited about it, this is the short answer. One last question. Um, I wanted to know, uh, which of, what is your favorite live music experience of all time? Go ahead, Patterson. I ran away from home when I was 16 to see Springsteen on the River Tour, and it's, I, that's still my favorite show. And uh, that, that, that was a great one, like 1981, uh, Friday the 13th, February 1981. <laughs> Startful Mississippi, and uh, it was amazing. And uh, and uh, I saw ACDC when I was in eighth grade. That was pretty great. And, uh, but I learned they weren't the best band that night, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And UFO opened and took the night, and no one ever believes me except for that guy over there because he was at the same show uh, 20 years before I met him, but uh, or at least 20 years. But uh, but you know, and and I, I mean, I saw. I saw four bands last week at uh we played the Primavera Festival in Barcelona last week and uh I, I, usually when we play festivals I don't I'm lucky if I see one other band cuz it's just such chaos out there and the last place I want to be is out there in the thick of it at a festival it's just I'm too old but uh but I had I was able to get to good vantage points to see the music at that particular festival they kind of let let you stand on the side and watch and um, I saw I saw f four of the best shows I've seen in ages just in one night I mean I, I'm still reeling from it you know Sher Sharon Van Etten who's just incredible and I saw Slint who I didn't think I would ever get to see and I saw the war on drugs and they were incredible and I saw Dr. John and he was incredible and that was all in one afternoon you know and and uh, so, uh, so it's still out there. Yeah, um, yeah favorite of all time is a uh, tough thing. I, one that just I'll never forget was seeing uh, uh, the Pixies in 88 and just being there with, you know, it's just it, your favorite music experience is gonna, it's not just the band, it's, it's being with friends, it's, it's being excited, it's that feeling of, that you're seeing something special, and that you know you've got that moment, and and uh, you know, um, despite the kind of violent skinhead, it was kind of near us. But yeah, it was a great, <laughs> the great night. But I mean, there's been so many over the years. Um, I think I saw you at the Neutral Milk Hotel show and at the Forty Watt uh, six months ago or whatever that was, and. That was that was such a fun night because it was that was one of those bands that I I never thought I'd see because I'd left Athens when they by yeah. the time they rolled in I missed and, them the first time too I yeah was, I was pretty excited to be there yeah I mean it's it is it just keeps happening All right. well mine I'll get mine so uh, I had a, the the Michael Landell this is the future I've seen the future moment with Janelle Monae at a little club in Atlanta early I think it was might have been the concert that. Uh, P. Diddy came to sign her, and my wife had had been inter had interviewed her and said, so "You gotta hear her." And I listened to the album. I was like, "Yeah, it's all right." And then I saw her live, and it was just Janelle Monae. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've never seen her. Yeah, I mean, just I up there on this club, and you felt like you were in an arena show with just the theatrics of it and the energy of it. And the, yeah, and you could even tell when somebody, you know, like Tim came back to the office and basically said that, I've seen the future of rock and roll, you know, like makes the grand proclamation and of course was dead on with that one. But I mean, you know, when somebody has that experience, they want to share it and that's kind of what we do and kind of being in an office of music lovers, that's, we just talk about that stuff all the time. Well, thank you for coming, Josh and Patterson. All right. And thank everyone for coming out. Thank you, guys.